There are different ways that God communicates with his own people. We must know these ways in order for us to walk and live in the will of God. Whilst we live in this ever-changing world, it is imperative that we follow God and that we allow him to guide us. God has made it possible for us to hear him and to allow him to guide us. In this sermon, we will go through different ways God guides us. And the last two ways may surprise you. The number one way you can hear from God every time and how God can guide you every single time is through the word of God. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 to 17 states, All scripture, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, that the woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Over 2000 years ago, Jesus came to this world to die for our sins and our transgressions. And he gave us a new life under the new covenant. None of us had the chance to meet him, nor listen to his teachings at the time. But thank God for the Bible. With the Bible, we have the opportunity to learn directly from God. With the scriptures presently available for us, we now have access to God's undiluted message to all of us. Over the years, and even until now, even until this very day, the scriptures have been a significant guide for Christians in this world, showing us what God wants us to do and how God wants us to live our lives and how to serve him, and ultimately guiding us through this world. It contains the instructions for everything that we may go through in this life. The Holy Spirit and the word of God are our principal guides in this world. The word of God is perfect for every situation. Deep within the pages of this book is eternal life. The Bible is God's textbook. We are not to pick up the Bible and just look at it as if it's an average textbook. This book has everything you need to get you from this life and into eternity. This is God's roadmap to direct us into heaven. This world is not our home. Heaven is our home. And as you begin to read this Bible, you see a clear theme that is telling you go this way and you make it safely home. Oh heaven. Every time I think of heaven, my mind goes to John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Do you understand that, my friend? Jesus has gone home to heaven to prepare a place for you. Now you need to do your part. You need to search the scriptures because in the scriptures you will find Jesus. The answer to your problems is not in a man. The answer to your problems is not in a woman. The answer to your problems is not in a doctor. The answer to your problems is not in a psychologist. Everything you need is in the word of God. Are you struggling with sin? Are you broken hearted? Are you lost and forgotten? The answer to your problems is in the word of God. In them you will find Jesus Christ. From Genesis 1 right through to the book of Revelations, you will find him and he will guide you to eternal life. The answer to your problems is in the word of God. If you're tired of making silly decisions, if you're tired of making decisions that you regret, you can find wisdom in the book of Proverbs. 
If you're tired of doubt and unbelief, you can find faith in the book of Hebrews. If you're seeking life, you can find it in the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, Mark and John. If you're seeking the Holy Spirit, you can find it in the book of Acts. The Bible has everything you need. I encourage you to read the word of God, search the scriptures and in the scriptures you will find Jesus Christ. The Bible encourages us to read the word of God. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 Study and show yourself approved unto God. John 5 verse 39 Search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. In this book you will find Jesus. Secondly, God guides us through the Holy Spirit. John 14 verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit was promised to us by Jesus so that he can guide us through this life. The Holy Spirit came to the earth after Jesus ascended into heaven. And since then, he has been the ultimate guide in our journey of faith. We can see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the life of the apostles and how he was guiding them revealing deep secrets of God to them, teaching them all they needed to do. And even up until this day, the Holy Spirit is still guiding God's people. He is still among us, telling us what to do. He lives in us and acts through us, guiding us, leading us. He is our connection to the Father, revealing the Father's ways for us, revealing the Father's will, to us. When we are faced with awkward situations in life, we should learn to rely totally on the guidance and the help of the Holy Spirit. Oh my friend, my friend, how we need the Holy Spirit, not only to guide us, but also to comfort us. Have you experienced a heartbreak? Have you experienced misery? Have you experienced disappointment? Have you experienced the storms and the thunders of life? Whatever you have experienced, then you need the Holy Spirit. Yield to Him. Open up your life to Him. Just imagine having God living inside you. Let Him come inside you. He will transform your life. Yield to the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, is through the human conscience that is influenced by the Holy Spirit. The key word there, the key phrase there, is influenced by the Holy Spirit. James 4.17 states, Therefore to him that knows to do good, and do it not, to him it is sin. God created us with a sense of reasoning, so that we can make the right decisions on our own, Human beings can think on their own, which has made them capable to decide on their own. Sometimes we don't need anyone to tell us what is good or bad. Some things are clear enough for us to decide on our own. Therefore we are guided by our conscience. You don't need anyone to tell you that stealing and cheating on others is wrong. You don't need any guidance to know that it is wrong. Most times we fall victim of doing bad things because we refuse to use our sense of reasoning. We refuse to listen to our conscience. We know what is right and wrong. We are guided by circumstantial signs that are compatible and aligned with the word of God. A perfect example of this is found in Exodus 13 21 and the Lord went before them by a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night 
in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. Moses asked God to go with them in their journey through the wilderness. And God showed them a sign that he's with them through the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In life, in life sometimes, God shows us signs to know his will concerning a particular thing. And unfortunately, sometimes we're too distracted and we miss it. And we end up thinking that God is not communicating with us. God guides his people in different ways. We need to be sensitive to his spirit and leading and his signs and signals. God wants to guide you, but you need to make an active effort. First of all, to seek him. James 4, 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Dealing with strongholds in life. Our battle as believers in Jesus Christ is not planned according to the way this world fights. This is why the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 and 5, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and everything that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul was instructing the church in Corinth on how to fight against and destroy strongholds and every lofty argument and opinions that exalt itself above the knowledge of God. In this passage, Paul is telling the church that these evil and vain imaginations are the very strongholds in which demons reside. Therefore, they have to be destroyed. He says, our weapons are not physical, for our warfare is spiritual in nature, and God has made available to the body of Christ the appropriate armory to engage in such warfare. Hence, the weapons that we use are those of the full armor of God found in Ephesians 6, verse 14 to 18, which consists of the belt of truth buckled around the waist, the breastplate of righteousness to cover your chest cavity and quench the fiery darts of the enemy, the helmet of salvation with your feet shod with the preparation that comes from the gospel of peace, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Now, before we go any further, we want to look at what a stronghold is. Or what are strongholds? A stronghold is a fortified place, such as a castle. It can be a defensive structure, like the walls of Jericho. Another example is found in Psalms 9 verse 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, meaning that God is a stronghold for believers. However, there are many kinds of strongholds in life, many which threatens our security in our hearts and some even threaten to destroy our very lives. It is these strongholds which affect our thought life, our behavior, our attitude, our character and our relationship with God the Father that we must deal with. But God knows all the strongholds and how to get rid of them. If you are willing to fight, if you are willing to fight with this piece of armor called prayer, we, however, have to pray in an attitude of humility and dependency on God and the Holy Spirit. Having said that, the Bible commands us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, meaning that there is supernatural power of God involved because we cannot get rid of these strongholds in our own power and in our own strength. 
We have to protect ourselves with the five pieces of defensive armor of God and yield the one offensive weapon which is the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Strongholds not only affect individual persons but they also affect families, churches, cities and even nations. A spiritual stronghold can be a habitual pattern of thoughts built into one's thought life. However, strongholds get more and more stronger as more stuff and more thoughts are stored in them. It may be depression, habitual bad temper or a repeated pattern in failure. It can even be an addiction of some sort. The list is endless and strongholds, it can be low self-esteem. The list is endless and strongholds have to be dealt with before they spread their roots and become more fortified. And this is how strongholds can affect someone by creating inner captivity, deception and misery. And they keep someone from thinking clearly. They keep someone from accepting the truth, repenting, getting deliverance. It can keep one from hearing the fullness of the good news, the fullness of the word of God. To the unbeliever, it stops someone from accepting Jesus Christ into their lives, telling him you are just fine as you are after all, you are a good person. Now a believer needs to develop a habit of focusing on Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. A believer has got to be dressed spiritually every single day, just as you need to put your physical clothes on. You need to put your armor of God on in the morning every single day, every day with the armor of God in order to deal with these strongholds. But first, one needs to identify the stronghold so that you know what you are fighting. For it is hard to take a stronghold that you don't know. Or another saying that I know, it's hard to fight an enemy that you don't know. In Ephesians 6, Paul states that while we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Instead, we focus on the resources and the weapons of our spiritual warfare. No stronghold can withstand a praying Christian wearing the full armor of God, battling with the word of God and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, as you fight, know one thing that you're not fighting strongholds of stone, but strongholds of imagination and arguments, not high things in towers, but boastful attitudes. We are not taking into captivity the enemy's soldiers, but we are taking into captivity the enemy's thoughts. As we fight to demolish these strongholds, we need to rest assurance in the knowledge of the word of God, which says in Psalms 144 verse 2, God is my steadfast love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer. Once you recognize the stronghold, the next step to bring it down is repentance. Ephesians 5.11 urges us to have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. As a believer, you need to let the light of God expose the darkness in you. Have an attitude of humility, being willing to let the light of God shine in all compartments of your life. Be honest before God and overcome the tendencies of defending yourself. Where the Spirit of God exposes areas of darkness in you, repent. For God desires a broken and contrite heart of a believer. Psalms 139 verse 23 to 24 states, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. The psalmist is laying his life bare before God, as if there is anything hidden to God, and asking to be led into eternal life. This is the attitude we need to come before God with, in order for him to deal with our strongholds in our life. Joshua and the children of Israel defeated and brought down fortified walls of Jericho by surrounding the city with the obedience of the word of God, 
faith and some praise to God. Psalms 32 verse 7 says, You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. A believer needs to surround the strongholds in their life with praise. For praise has been ordained to shame the devil and silence the enemy. Praise is a powerful way of bringing down strongholds. For every negative stronghold, there is a way of surrounding it opposite positive truth from the word of God. For someone struggling with depression, with the stronghold of depression, you need to surround it with hope. Christ in me, the hope of glory. If you're struggling with rejection, with the love of God and his acceptance, anyone struggling with unresolved anger, one needs to exercise and practice forgiveness. For one struggling with fear, know that fear is not from God, but instead confess that God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you're struggling with the stronghold of failure, surround it with the victory. Victory in which that comes from the cross. Victory in which which is obtained by our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. As a believer, fill yourself with the word of God. Or as the Bible says, let the word of God dwell richly in you. Let it be food for your spirit. Feed your spiritual man with the Holy Scriptures. Be filled with the Holy Spirit to overflow and purpose and pray that God build up a stronghold within your mind and heart. The stronghold of the living God. One of the most amazing things that you and I as Christians have long taken to realize is about the element of being prepared for blessings or blessings to come. It is very important that before any blessing comes from the Lord, one needs to be prepared. The Bible is awash with such examples that show the need to prepare and receive the blessing. I believe that prayerfully and by the grace of God, we will get an understanding of this teaching. The following are examples of preparedness in the lives of individuals to receive a blessing. However, before we examine other examples, let us start with the illustrations and demonstrations by the Lord Jesus. Matthew 14 verse 19 And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. In this verse, we get a snippet of the narrative on the feeding of the five thousand by the Lord from five loaves and two fishes. In this verse, we see the Lord directing and instructing the people to sit down before the blessing. We also observe the same instruction by our Lord Jesus in a separate narrative of the feeding of the five thousand people. Matthew 15 verse 35 so he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. The Lord Jesus on both occasions would then give thanks. As such, the miracle, the blessing would come. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let us take a look at other incidences where order had to be established before the blessing. No water until preparation is done. 2 Kings 3 verse 9 So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host, and for the cattle that followed them. As indicated in the verse, the three kings were stuck and facing a crisis because of this water handicap. The prophet of God consulted the God of Israel, who instructed these people to dig ditches in preparation for rain. 2 Kings 3 verse 16 And he said, Thus saith the Lord, 
make this valley full of ditches. In this narrative, we see God requiring people to get ready. Dig ditches, then the blessing will come. They did. And verse 17 tells us that God told them that he was not going to provide water through rain, but was just going to do it. 2 Kings 3 verse 17 For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink, both ye and your cattle and your beasts. When the trenches were done, the water came. 2 Kings 3 verse 20 And it came to pass in the morning, when the meat offering was offered, that, behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. Glory to God! No oil until vessels are gathered. 2 Kings 4 Having lost her husband, she inherited debt which needed paying up. Her children were about to be taken as bondmen to pay that debt. She went to Elisha, the man of God, and cried about her situation. Elisha's response is narrated in 2 Kings 4 verse 3. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbours, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. She prepared for her blessings by being obedient to the instruction to borrow vessels. Soon after this happened, according to 2 Kings 4 verses 4 to 6, And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Glory to God. No healing. Naman, 2 Kings 5. Naman, the war general, went all the way to Samaria in search of healing. On arrival, he was told by Elisha to go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. The general had to wash seven times as preparation for the healing to take place. When preparation was done, the narrative sums the whole episode in verse 14. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Glory to God. No vision without obedience. John 9 gives a narrative of the blind man. Incidentally, the blind man was a subject of debate regarding his blindness. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus responded by saying the blindness was about for the glory of God to be revealed. The Lord Jesus prepared the blind man for his blessing by making clay of the spittle. Verses 6 and 7 When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. Even though Jesus had put the spittle on his eyes, 
It was just preparation for the blessing which came to the blind man when he obeyed to go to the pool of Siloam. Glory to the name of Jesus. Are you and I prepared to receive the blessing? The blessings of the feeding of five thousand came when the crowd obeyed the instruction to sit down. Brothers and sisters, God has got order. For God is not a God of disorder but of peace, as in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Water came for the three kings mentioned earlier on because of obedience to dig trenches as instructed by God. The woman in 2 Kings 4 got her blessing to stop her children being bonded as debt repayment by obeying the instruction to borrow as many vessels as she could. She further obeyed the instruction to close herself with her children and pour the oil into the jars, and her blessing is that the oil was bottomless until no jar was available to be filled anymore. Brothers and sisters, when we are in His presence, when we summon Him, when we cry to Him, let us sometimes be prepared to receive further instructions, because that may well be the difference between receiving the blessing or not. The choice is yours to call it a blessing or a miracle. He is faithfully to His word. He can do it for you. Let us continue to believe, brethren. Amen.